There was a video of, of uh, Rupert in one of his online, um, you know, chess. You know, chess. Uh, a woman in Ukraine that was in Ukraine got on the line and said that she was afraid that she's going to die. And what can he say to her? And so uh, he, he said some things to her about, you know, the opportunity to experience yourself as the awareness. And that the, what was happening to a lot of the people in Ukraine was that um, the circumstances pushed them out of their personality into awareness where they were experiencing an impersonal sense of commitment to freedom, an impersonal sense of commitment to freedom. Uh, it's a similar thing to what the uh, Peace Pilgrim spoke of when she said that, and, and I'm sure she had her own fears, you know, when she said that all that was removed, all that was removed. And in that video, uh, I don't know, you can tell me what you think, but in that video, I saw her shift. She, in the beginning, she, you could see she was, she was frightened, right? And after, after a few minutes talking to him and listening to what he pointed to, she started to smile. And she told uh, Rupert that she loved him. So that's the shift, right? And it's not only that, that's, it's not only the shift for her, it's the shift for us. It's the shift. It's the shift for all of us. Because, you know, one of the things that this situation that exists right now has brought up for people is um, their relation, it's, it's brought people, if it's brought up for people the relationship they have with one another, the relationship they have with people on the other side of the world, the relationship they have with the political situation, right? It's brought that up into, uh, in a, into awareness, and then this whole business of peace comes into play. Uh, but it's an opportunity for anybody that wants to really discover reality. It's an opportunity for anybody that really wants to discover what peace is. You know, so, so my recommendation is if, if you're interested in peace, if you think peace is, is a, a good idea, right? If you would like to see peace in the world, then ask yourself a very important question. What is peace? Really, what is peace? Not, not what you learned in school, no, but really what does it mean to experience peace? Because the reality of it is the, for people to talk about peace with the situation that exists right now, mostly is hypocritical. It's mostly hypocritical because the very same people that want to see peace in the world don't experience peace in their own personal life. Therefore, I assert that they really don't know what peace is. You know, if you don't know what you're talking about, how could you expect other people to, to uh, agree with you or to take it on for themselves? if you don't really know what you're talking about. And you know, in the spiritual teachings, the, the idea of peace is, is part of the teaching. And, and, and the, the teaching that is involved, as the Dalai Lama spoke about this 15 years ago when I listened to him talk about war. And he said, if you, if you really don't like the idea of war, if you're really concerned about it, right, then stop being at war in your own mind. Right. Start paying attention there and seeing there's no if there's no if you don't if there's no peace in your own experience, then what are you talking about with peace? And then you hear the same people that say they would like to see peace. Right. Be be unpeaceful, be aggressive, be antagonistic, make judgments. Right. So if 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 you get involved with. Uh, and it's easy to do it. If you get involved with the point of view that the good guys and the bad guys, right, and Putin's a bad guy and he's evil, and you know, that's not peaceful. That's not. That's war. That's 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 cybernetic war, right? That you're taking odds, and you're taking a position about it, and so forth. I read some. What did I see? I guess I saw that on Facebook today, where somebody posted a thing where they had a picture of Jesus uh, washing somebody's feet, you know, in the, in the Bible, that was a way of showing your, 
humility and respect for uh, spiritual beings is to wash their feet, right? And what it said, the caption said, would you wash Putin's feet? Yeah. And you know, if you're free, if you're really free, and if you see things as they are, and if you're really peaceful, that wouldn't be a problem. That wouldn't be a problem. And you know, and it goes back to what we talked about here in terms of the, uh, the idea that if it's true, if it's true, if reality is that um, peace is a natural way of being, if reality is that peace uh, is a function as the peace pilgrim, I guess I'm going to be quoting peace pilgrim these days. This is the peace that passes understanding. This is the peace that people don't know. People have a concept about peace. You have to relinquish self-will. She said, peace, peace can't occur. You cannot experience peace as long as you have self-will. You have to relinquish self-will. That's her word, relinquish self-will. And so what does it mean? It means you have to let go. It means you have to start training yourself to see the truth. You have to start training yourself to see thy will be done. And, and I can tell you from my own you know, working with this, it's possible. It's possible to, to, to live in the world as it is. It's possible to live in reality. It's possible to be who you are. It's, you know, it's called sahaja, the natural state. It's possible to be naturally who you are, and it's possible to naturally be related to reality as reality is. This is the teaching. That's basically the bottom line with the teaching, because the teaching whether, whether you talk about it in, in specific terms of, as far as what belief systems are involved and all that other jazz. But the bottom line is the only teaching that's worth anything is the teaching, not the teaching for peace, right? But the teaching for peace is directly associated with your coming to see the end of suffering. Is it not? Yeah. If you're not suffering, don't you think you'd have a better shot at peace, right? So then what is the definition of suffering? See, I, you know, the, the, it's interesting because I keep finding out when I'm talking to people who've read my book and listen, and listen to the teachings and so forth, right? But the brain is stupid, <laughs> isn't it? So you could listen to the truth and it goes in, out, in and out, right? It either goes in and out or there is a barrier that got put up a brain barrier or you know some kind of psychological barrier that got put up right and i've heard muji talk about this right that you could somebody could be speaking the truth and no uncertain terms in your presence right and you literally won't hear them yeah you're somewhere else yeah you literally won't hear what they said right and i've i've discovered that that's true because i talk to people who i've who've been around this conversation for a while and have heard these things again and again and again. And then I say, okay, tell me what's going on in your life. And it's obvious, it's obvious when they start to talk, they're completely identified with what they're thinking. Completely identified with their emotions, right? Have no real clarity or no real clear idea and no confirmation about reality. And so it's a process, right? It's a process where when that happens, I say, okay, here we go, you know, back to the basics, right? So if the end of suffering allows for peace, right, what's the source of the suffering? Because in these teachings and practices, we're not dealing with symptom control, right? We're not dealing with stopping, controlling how you feel, controlling pain in the body, controlling your uh, emotional and psychological state through modern chemistry. No, we're not talking about any of that. We're talking about, okay, we're not dealing with symptoms here. We want to go right to the source. What's causing it? Let's get to the cause of your anxiety. Let's get to the cause of your fear. Let's get to the cause of your confusion. Let's get to the cause of your suffering. And what is the cause? This is important. This is the kind of thing you want to really, and, 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 and when I say it goes in one ear and out the other, or it bounces right off, right? I'm not saying anything about you. Now watch, the person will hear that like I'm talking about you. I'm not saying anything about you. And if you think I'm saying something about you, you're not going to hear what I'm about to say. You understand? You'll be upset about my having said something about you. 
okay? But I'm not saying anything about you. I'm talking about the brain, and you're not the brain. I'm talking about the mind, and you're not the mind. I'm talking about the conditioning, and you didn't have anything to do with that. You didn't have any choice about that. So don't get, you know, don't let yourself get sidetracked that way. No. You know, it just come to an understanding that part of what it's going to take for you to consistently be awake and know the truth is practice. So I can say, you know, what's the source of the suffering? And we have to keep going over these basic things, right? Because they're fundamental to your practice, right? And the practice has to become the way you're being all the time. You've got to be practicing all the time. We have to get you from formal practice to informal practice, or you have to get yourself from in, uh, formal to informal, right? It's not that formal practice won't make a difference, right? But if you extend it to informal practice, it'll accelerate the process tremendously, okay? So what's the source of suffering? Okay, I, don't, I, I, would, get, I would pass that on a test, okay? Not accepting what is. Exactly. It's not just thinking, right? It's a certain kind of thinking, right? It's resistant thinking. It's self-righteous thinking, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. You, you think you know, right? That's the beginning of trouble, right? Yeah. And one of the things you think you know, <laughs> now watch, and one of the things you think you know is that things aren't right, right? One of the things you think you know is things should be different than this. I should be different. You should be different. It should be different. The past should be different. The future should be different. The car I own should be different. How much money I have should be different. What my body looks like should be different. What your body looks like should be different. Right? This is the machine that's running all the time in your head. All the time, right? And how do you know it's a machine running? If you pay attention, you can watch the upsets. Because everything you think should be different causes an upset, right? An unfulfilled expectations. Your expectations keep getting disappointed. You wake up in a disappointed state of mind, don't you? You wake up like, oh, well, here we go again. Now I gotta turn on the news and find out who killed who, you know? Now I gotta turn on the news and, and get myself afraid again about what's gonna happen and what's gonna happen to me and what's gonna happen to us and how much money do I have and, you know? You just go, you, right, it doesn't take long to spin right off, you know? You spin right off into the typical neurotic state. And then you go and try and function, <laughs> right? You got this mess in your head going on, and then you got to go earn a living, right? And put up with people, and put up with everything, put up with politics, put up with money, put up with your family, put up with your body, and earn a living too. No wonder alcohol is so popular. No wonder pot's becoming legal so quickly, you know? No wonder they're using LSD to treat mental illness. <laughs> you know what I mean? Back in the 60s, they said, oh, don't take that stuff, it'll make you crazy. Now it's, now take it's that stuff, it'll make you sane. <laughs> right? Only now it's in a controlled setting, right? Th that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now instead of just rec taking it for recreation, right. now you're taking it for treatment purposes, right? right? But you know, it's an interesting thing when you talk about these, these chemicals that alter consciousness, right? One of the most biased realities that exist in terms of the way we think about things is the bias that we have about these natural substances that alter consciousness. They have always been part of uh, societies all over the world, okay? And in most societies, they have been considered, now watch, the, the, the psilocybin and the, and the uh, hallucinogenics that are now being used for treatment, right? If you jump over the 60s and go back to other earlier times in the world, they were being used for religious experiences and for mental health treatment. They were. Marijuana, cocaine, right? Psilocybin, peyote, right? They were being used. Back in the 60s, when I read the Carlos Castaneda books, you, none of you have, none, anybody ever hear that? I've heard you heard them? Yeah. Don Juan, right? Uh, those books were about a graduate student that went to uh, New Mexico to try and study 
a Yaque Indian, Mexican Indian tribe that used uh, peyote as part of the rituals, okay? And he got involved with a sorcerer. He got involved with a Mexican sorcerer, and the sorcerer said, that, and he wanted to interview him for his master's degree, right, for his thesis. And the sorcerer's name was Don Juan, and he said, no, 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 I'm not, you can't interview me, but if you become my apprentice, I'll tell you everything I know. So he did. He became his apprentice for two years, right? And part of teaching him how to manage and navigate his way through the, the, uh, the energetic, psychological, and emotional, and psychic worlds, right, was he, he gave him mescaline. He gave him mescaline, and you know, and you can, those books are still available. And then Carlos Castaneda wrote about his first mescaline trip. But it was in the context of spirituality. It was in the context of this being a sacred process with these Yaque Indians, right? And it goes on and on. I think it ended up with like six books, right, about his experiences, right? So it's interesting, and now, but what, what now, when you look at it now, all these substances are, are considered um, negative, considered dangerous, and so forth and so on. Where now, I saw on Facebook, um, they have ads on Facebook now where you can order uh, psychedelic drugs and have them sent to your home. Yeah. So things are changing, right? Dramatically. What was bad is now good. What was Good is now bad, right? That's the way things go. That's why you're better off uh, taking the direct route. That's why you're better off only trusting what you can see directly for yourself. Because the rest of it is going to be influenced by all kinds of factors, right? Like my, making money, sure. right? Or, being con or controlling you, you know? There's all kinds of other factors. But that's why it makes sense to make sure that everything you read, everything you hear, can only be of use to you if it's pointing to something that you can then look and see for yourself. Otherwise, it's all beliefs. What's the difference between what you were uh, uh, indoctrinated to believe and taking on new beliefs? It's the same stuff. You can't know if it's true. You just accept that it's true through a belief. But the thing that you can know if it's true and you don't have to accept through a belief is you. You don't have to believe that you exist, do you? No, you don't have to believe that you exist. You don't, it's, if you look at awareness, if you look at awareness and you see its nature and you see that it's formless, timeless, that it has no emotions, that it's not going anywhere, right? It's already at peace, right? If you look at it and you see those things, you're seeing it directly. You're not seeing it. That's not a belief. It's awareness observing itself. It's awareness seeing itself, right? And it's the only time that it's not a subject-object relationship. Every other time it's a subject-object relationship. But awareness is a subject-subject relationship. Its awareness includes awareness of itself. Not like it could get away from it and look back, right? That's subject-object, right? No. The awareness that it is is aware of itself. It radiates awareness. It's, it is, it, the awareness has a knowing quality to it. This is very important because we don't, we don't trust that in the beginning. We think, oh, I have to think about it. That's because you were raised that way, right? You were taught to think about it, you know? You, thinking is, is a skill. Teach the children to think. Teach them to think rationally, right? Have them learn to think about everything. Well, how are they ever gonna trust their awareness? Nobody says anything about be aware. Well, now they're saying being, now they say be mindful, but I don't think that's communicating really. I don't think that's really communicating. But the, the reality of it is, and you can test this out for yourself. Is it not the case that your awareness knows? Look, your awareness knows. When you're not thinking, you still know, right? When you're practicing meditation and you move your attention from the thinking activity to awareness of the body breathing, you don't go into terror because you don't know what's going on, do you? No, you still know. Why? Because that's how you always knew. The awareness is that which knows. That which, you, it's it's got to be that which knows is because, because if the person doesn't actually exist, the person can't know anything, right? And the brain can't know anything because it depends on information. 
It only knows the information that's there, right? There's only one possibility for knowing, and that's consciousness. Consciousness is alive. Consciousness is awake. It's alive. It's actually seeing what's happening, right? And, and it knows immediately what it's seeing. It doesn't, you don't have to think about it. Right now, if you look around this room, if somebody were to take a pad and pencil and write down everything in this room, it would take hours, wouldn't it? And yet you could look and see it all at once. You know the whole thing at once. Right? You don't have to go from one, you don't have to say, oh, that's a piece of paper, okay, I got that. You don't have to do that. The awareness knows what it sees, immediately knows what it sees, okay? Which means you can relax. You don't have to think. You don't have to burn that energy, right? All you have to do is relax and be aware. And that awareness will open up, will open you up to what's beyond the thought activity. It will open you up what's beyond your limited idea about everything. And this is why you have these people who talk about things being downloaded to them that are beyond anything they could have thought about. And this is why you have people to talk about experience of blissfulness. The experience of bliss is the experience of being all that exists at the same time. Being all that exists at the same time. Incomprehensible, right? Right, non-conceptual, right? But nonetheless a possible experience, right? You can experience all there is at the same time because when you get your ego out of the way, when you realize you're not the personality and you start practicing experiencing yourself that way, you're aligning yourself with the source. That's what, right? You're aligning yourself with the source. Now instead of thinking what you think is true, no, now what you recognize to be the truth is what you're aware of, not what you think. And what you're aware of is eternal. What you're aware of is endless. What you're aware of is the awareness is, the, is everything. It is, it is immediate, intimate knowledge of all reality. Immediate, infinite knowledge of all reality. You can't, you can't talk about that, can you? No, but the experience must be available. It must be available, right? When you, when, you, when, you, when, you remove your, when you remove the obstacle to connecting to the source, the possibility of your experiencing that eternal truth has to exist, has to exist. So that's the ball game, so. Is the obstacle the mind? Well, the, uh, the, yeah, you could say that the, ob the obstacle the is, is, yeah, but the personality is thinking, isn't it? Sure. Yeah. So thinking is the way the person maintains its existence, right? Thinking is the way the person maintains a false existence, an appearance of existence, right? Uh, but it's not an actual existence. And it doesn't mean, and again, you know, uh, it doesn't mean that the person doesn't exist as a concept. It doesn't mean the person doesn't exist as a construct. It doesn't mean the person doesn't exist as a convention. You know, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist as something that you have to continue to operate with, right? But it's a big difference to know that it's not actually real. It doesn't actually exist. And the reason there's a big difference for you to come to see that that's the case is because it's not just a matter of it not being real, it's a matter of you considering yourself to be that. It's not just a matter of it not being real, it's a matter of you considering yourself to be that, which means you considered yourself to be something that wasn't real. And I was talking to somebody about this this morning in regard to the fact that if you stay within the conventional understanding of everything, right? Right now, the, right now uh, Healing trauma is a big deal right now in psychotherapy. It's, it's getting a lot of it, it's fashionable, right? And there are a lot of people out there that are presenting new approaches to treating trauma, right? Well, I, I have an approach that's much simpler than any of them, right? St stop being the one who was traumatized, right? If, if, if you stop being the one who was traumatized, if you see that the one who was traumatized never actually existed, right? The trauma disappears because it was only held in place by the belief that there was a person who was traumatized. If that belief is seen for what it is, 
How could the trauma exist? Because you realize there was nobody for it to happen to. Now, here's the, here's the, here's the trick with that. That doesn't mean that there was a time when you thought you were the body and the person and something happened that traumatized you. It doesn't mean that that didn't happen, right? But if you wake up, right, that clears up the, the trauma in terms of it having a life of its own, and there will still be residual emotional material in your body. Because when it ha originally happened, you thought you were the body. When it originally happened, you thought you were the person. And because it was too much, right, because you were overwhelmed, the system stuffs that reactive energy, that fear and whatever else is there, it stuffs it down into the system because it, it can't deal with it, otherwise you'll go nuts. It'll be too overwhelming, right? So that energy is residual from the past and it'll, it's still in the body, right? But when you practice meditation and you stop being what you're not, right? Over time, that energy will start to bubble up, right? You've heard people talk about this in meditation, right? It'll start to bubble up. And if you've had guidance and you understand what's going on, this is good. You're glad that it's bubbling up. You want it to bubble up. If it, if it wants you to cry, cry. If it wants you to experience anger, experience anger. If it wants you to grieve, grieve. If it wants you to experience sadness, experience sadness. Why? Because it's energy. And the experience of the energy is the dissipation of that energy being released. So all that happens in regard to trauma, if you do this work, that's a big it. All that happens with trauma, if you do this work and you do these practices, right, is the, upon the recognition of your true nature, right, the person who was traumatized doesn't exist. Then the residual right, energy that's stuffed in the body, stuck in the body, that'll come up and disperse naturally as you continue to practice. And that's all, need, that's all that needs to be the case, right, in order to deal with trauma. Now, the other factor is obviously that in the, in the early stages of your experiencing your true nature, right, there's the flip-flop process, right, Right, where, where you, you, you keep kind of losing your, your, uh, your awareness of yourself as awareness and, and your attention gets taken by the activity of the person, your attention gets taken by the activity of thought, and when it gets taken, right, uh, you fall into identifying with it. When you fall into identifying with it, then the awareness that you thought you were is gone. What happened? Where'd it go, right? I was feeling so great, everything was so clear, I was in the zone, right? I was in the flow, right? And then I had this thought, wow, this is really cool, man, I wanna really share this with my friends, and all of a sudden it was gone. Yeah. Right? That's the personality commenting, right? And if you identify with that comment, it, now you're back into the personality, right? And then you complain, what happened? So what you have to do to get out of that is to understand, no, it's not true that you stop being who you really are. All you did was go back to paying attention to everything but that, which is what you were doing all along before you learned this, right? Paying attention to everything but that. Why? Because you learned that nothing exists that doesn't show up in time and space. Didn't you? Yeah, it, 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 you learned that Nothing exists except what shows up in time and space. And so for a long time, it wouldn't even occur to you to consider who you are because you don't show up in time and space and you don't have a form. It wouldn't even occur to you to consider that, right? Because you learned that everything that exists exists in time and space, right? And if you're looking for something, you should be able to see it. And you can't see yourself, right? So for most people, they would say, because they exist only in that world, they would say, get out of here. <laughs> get out of here with this idea. You, got, you people are kidding yourself. What are you, on drugs? Get out of here. What are you talking about? Yourself. What's self? Right? And, you know, their point is well taken, right? Because if you only saw things the way they saw things, you would not see what you now see either. Right? But one of the things that has to change in order for you to recognize yourself is to stop looking for something that's not you. Stop looking for something that has a form. Stop looking for something that is a noun, a thing. 
Stop looking for that. Stop looking for something that exists in time. And if you give up those childish notions about yourself and start to pay attention in a way that allows you to actually see what's so, it's not hard to notice your awareness, is it? Now, if I say to you, are you aware, right? It's, that's not hard, right? Do you have to like go, go, go somewhere and look it up? No, it's immediate, right? And if I say to you, uh, are you aware now? The answer will be the same in five minutes, 10 minutes, two hours, two weeks, 10 years, right? So obviously, whatever that is that you notice and say, yes, I see it, doesn't change. It's always there. The question is, it doesn't change, right? The question is, are you distracted from being aware of it and experiencing it so that you're living in denial about reality, which is the case for most people? That's the biggest challenge about all this, right? Because you can be as clear as the day is long and walk out of here and somebody could bump into you and piss you off <laughs> and the whole thing's out the window. <laughs> because there, and the reason that that's the case is because when you get that bump, right? The brain says, oh, somebody might kill you here. That's right. Goes right to that. Goes right, somebody might kill you here, right? And so the system goes on high alert, right? Just like uh, Putin, right? As long as, as long as peace is not experienced on a personal level, Obviously, we have to have wars because the, the lack of peace that we experience individually, right, gets projected out and we see the world the way we see ourselves. We see the world the way we experience our own internal reality. So we project it out into the world, right? If, there's, if, if, there, if thy will be done is not true, then we're at war. Do you understand? Because if thy will be done is not true, it means that I am the cause of my behavior. And if my behavior threatens you, you got to stop me, right? Well, now we got war. So that's why thy will be done is the cure of everything, really. If there was a way to wave a wand across the universe, and so everybody on the planet all at once would see the truth, which is thy will be done, there would be peace. Because it's not just thy will be done, it's understanding the implications of that means that if thy will be done, it means that I am not doing it, you're not doing it, I can't do it, you can't do it. We're all in the same boat here, right? It's all happening and all that we can do is be a witness to it. And if that's the case, then I can't accuse you of anything, you can't accuse me of anything, I can't be arrogant, you, you can't be proud, because if we didn't do anything, that knocks a lot of stuff off the table. Then what's left? I can't consider you a threat, can I? You know, it's the same thing. The same difficulty you would have in, in swallowing thy will be done, which you do, I understand, so do I, because it's so radically different, right, than our indoctrination, right? The same radical truth that would have you have so much conflict with swallowing that is the same truth that would have you have conflict with swallowing the idea that if you experienced everything that Putin experienced, right, you would be Putin. And if you were Putin, you'd do what Putin's doing. That's very hard for a lot of people to get, right? But it's true. It's absolutely true, right? How could it not be true? Because your behavior is a function of everything you've learned and how that results in what you think, isn't it? So the same thing is true for him. So if, 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 if you are not the source, then he's not the source either. Right? Yeah. But if somebody has a gun in your face. That, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, somebody has a gun. So what I'm saying to you is, this may sound harsh, but it's true. It, 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 if somebody has a gun in your face, or if you're under immediate threat to die like she was, right? It's a lot easier to hear the possibility, right? Because you're desperate. If you're starving, if you're, if you're dying from thirst and somebody's got some water, you know what I mean? It's very easy for you to accept that water, right? But the, de but the, the situation is that uh, we're all in that position all the time, but because we're in denial about it, we don't have that experience she's having. 
but you're under the same gun she's under. And if I say to you, how much worse can it get than to experience your life as threatened? And you say, well, it can't get much worse. And I say, that's the condition you're living in right now. You can afford to act as if it's not true until you walk out of here and a car hits you. And then you could say, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was always possible for a car to hit me. And I was living as if that would never happen to me. Right? See, if you want to accelerate the process of waking up, then let yourself make contact with the truth. And the truth is, you may be dead before the sun rises tomorrow. That's true. That's as true for you as it is for her. So you're in the same boat as she is, but you don't experience it because you don't have the props. She's got props. She's got bombs falling. Right? Yeah. So you can afford to be in denial, right? until you get the diagnosis or until you get in an accident, right? Or, or, you know, but if you want to accelerate the process of waking up, remove that screen and let yourself make contact with the truth. And the truth is your life is in danger all the time, all the time. And, and your, and the end of your life may be this week. And if thy will be done is true, it's, a, it's written in stone, and you just don't know when it's going to happen. Yeah. It's just like uh, that uh, physicist, Stephen, what was his name? I can never remember. Oh, yeah, yeah he's, he, you know, he, he's, here's a guy that studied physics, and he considered as smart as Einstein when it comes to physics. And when he was asked, is it true that there's no free will? He said, yes, it's true there's no free will, but we don't know what's going to happen. And that's the situation you're in. You don't know what's going to happen, which means that your body, see, that's the thing. Your, the body is subject to all the laws that govern physical reality, right? Already you're in trouble, <laughs> right? Already you're in trouble. You have to worry about gravity. You have, have to worry about objects moving that will move toward your body and kill you, right? So there's all the reason in the world to, uh, to allow yourself to make contact with the truth. And if you do, then what he said to that girl becomes very real and relevant. All you have to do is let go of the personal identification. The impersonal consciousness is always there and available for you to identify with that. And when you identify with that, a smile will come on your face because nothing can happen to you. That's what he got across to her. Yes. Nothing can happen to you. Well, but, but it don't, don't try and get it from watching that. Okay. Try and get it from paying attention to the truth of yourself. Okay. Because that's all that he was pointing at with her, is the truth of herself. Nothing can happen to you. So you, you need not be afraid. That's the thing that I spoke about when I started talking today, right? Yeah, nothing can happen to you. You need not be afraid. Death can't happen to you. You need not be afraid. That's reality. That's the truth. That's what we are involved with, the, with realizing and experiencing. And one way to deal with that effectively is to let go of your naive, childish, immature notions about who you are and about what's real. That's what's in the way. That's what's in the way. And so you have to keep dealing with it, don't you? You have to wake up in the morning and deal with it immediately. And then you have to pay attention and watch how it keeps coming back. You, you know, you wake up in the morning and you, like I've been saying here, you wake up in the morning and the person wakes up. Okay, so you notice that and you change the channel. Now I'm aware of the person waking up, right? But before I can get to the bathroom, a thought occurs in my mind about a bill that I didn't pay and now I'm upset. So it's a constant practice, isn't it? It's a constant practice. You have to be vigilant. You have to be watching because the machine, if it runs on its own, it's going to take you back into the idea that you're a person and it's going to take you back into being fear-based. And then you're going to be anxious and then you're going to get depressed, right? And then you're not going to be able to eat. Then you're not going to be able to sleep and then you're going to start taking drugs, right? So pay attention and, you know, make, make, make use of this. Make use of this opportunity. That's what this is. 
If you want to know what a simple and direct, realistic answer to the question, what's life all about, right? A good, simple, direct answer to the question is life is an opportunity. It's an opportunity. You can't, you couldn't wake, you couldn't wake up and recognize who you are unless you first lost contact with that. That's called the human birth. You couldn't wake up and recognize who you are unless you first lost contact with that. That's called the human birth. But now you've had the, the blessing, you've had the grace of God to have you come in contact with reality and with the truth. But unless you practice it, unless you take it on and make it something that you're convinced of, make it something that you consider to be the most important thing you could give your energy and attention to, unless you do that, probability will take its toll and you'll fall back into the shit. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's possible to realize the truth, right? But it's not probable. It's not probable. What's probable is that you'll die ignorant, like most people. That's probable. This is just possible. And if the possibility is to be realized, you're going to have to identify with that. You're going to have to give that your energy. That's where you're going to have to pay attention. And if you do it consistently, the day will come when it will be natural. Because it is natural. It's only unnatural because you've been something other than what you actually are. Gabish? Uh, Gabish? <laughs> All right, see you guys later. <laughs>